The year is 2010. You are a creative type who is suffering from writer's block. Your wife, how lucky are you, decides that a vacation would be pretty dope this time of year. You travel to the ocean town of Bright Falls, where, trick, your wife thinks therapy would be a good idea. Since you are a straight white male, you proudly proclaim that therapy it's useless. That getting in touch with your feelings would only cause more problems. Then your wife gets got and the game really begins. You use the light to fight these shadowy men from a shadowy planet to uncover what is up in Bright Falls and save your wife. But first you must write a book. Actually, the year is 2023 and you're the dumbest boy in all the land. In an attempt at being a creative type, <laughs> you uh, run into a wall prohibiting you from creating, chalking it up to working full time for the first time since before the worst year of your life, and getting burned out. Instead of going to therapy disguised as a vacation, you start swimming one mile three times a week and building a lot of gunpla. It isn't until your last day of freelance work that you realize that you must force yourself to create in order to be creative. With the help of Not Enough Sleep, a game you love from the last year you felt truly alive, and the album Cassiopeia by Cassiopeia, you can get back in the game. But first, you had to write this intro. Actually, the year is 2010, and you're really an 18-year-old boy weeks away from prom and graduating high school. Weeks away from going to art school because you thought that being a creative type could be fulfilling. Your days are spent with your friends playing Magic the Gathering at lunch in between the three classes you had that offered computers so you could play Tetris with those same friends. You are barred from making announcements for your school's play because your bits were too funny. You are days away from harshing someone's vibe. You have no idea what is about to happen to you on Saturday, May 29th, 2010. You might not even be the same person you were going in once you've left. Welcome to my review of Remedy's 2010 classic, Alan Wake. In 1995, Remedy opened for business. They went from their debut game being a top-down death racer to a very popular game series that then they sold away to fund a passion project that then defined them. Which is weird, because you'd think that Max Payne would define them rather than a game that was a commercial flop that wasn't popular until they made a wildly more successful game in Control that they then used to tie in their first love. They bet on themselves in a big way, and they were barely right? at the start, but nine years later, they hit it big. They answered the question, what if a game studio just b built itself on postmodern literature? Remy did just that by weaving all their titles together. Alan Wake is an interesting game from a business standpoint. Remedy had a successful IP, Max Payne, with the support of a big company, Rockstar. They then took a monumental risk and sold the rights to Max Payne to Rockstar in order to essentially fund their own endeavor, which would become Alan Wake. It was a passion project for the company. What they wanted to make was a large open world game that still had that psychological thriller aspect that they drew their inspirations from. Not to name any names, I will not be mentioning any of their inspirations in this review. The problem was that the puzzle they were trying to piece together was too different. A lot of the map was already built, but Remedy couldn't land on a story? Their eyes were far bigger than their stomach. This forced Remedy to do a lockdown of the writer's room to figure out what the story was going to be. By that point, they were running out of development time, so sacrifices had to be made. 
The open world idea was totally scrapped, forcing a more linear story despite them wanting to get away from that post-Max pain. They even had to eliminate the idea of having a PC port of the game on launch, leading it to be a purely Xbox 360 exclusive. But even then, problems were popping up. Their game engine, Northlight, consistently saw objects moving on their own. They had no way of fixing this or even recreating the problem especially with the time given with the release coming closer. So they had to adapt, making these objects enemies. They gave the objects hitboxes and health bars, so when the player came upon them, they'd get attacked, but also could eliminate the object. A brilliant bit of improvising from the team and the living embodiment of the phrase, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Alan Wake, after five torturous years of development, came out on May 14th, 2010. It had widespread positive reviews from both critics and general audiences. The issue was that it was a, a, a commercial flop, which tracks if you've listened to the episode of John Talks where I drafted this game as one of my favorite games. All right, first pick of round two. Uh, this is, I don't know how many people have played this game. I feel like I'm the only person in the entire planet that has played this game. And it's Alan Wake. People who played it loved it. It's just that not a lot of people played it. People did have some issues with the game. It didn't visually look good. Some of the lip syncing was off and some of the cutscenes stuttered. It was a game that came out five years too late. The graphics and gameplay reflect that as they look and seem dated upon the game's initial release. And that is if you care about those sort of things. The good news is that more than a decade later, Remedy brought new life to Alan Wake by including it in their hit game Control. Alan Wake became a very successful cult classic, which means I was, for once, on a cult classic before it gained that status. Very proud are we. I think a lot of that can be attributed to how we view games now. Sure, the gameplay is even more archaic now, but the idea of a self-serving story in a game is more appealing than just how a game plays now. It's what led to Remedy to release a remastered version, though uh, somehow that is more unplayable than the original version. Somehow the characters look worse in that remaster and it looks like they're they're made of clay. I don't know how they managed to make a, a, a more unplayable game from an already playable game. The remaster also didn't sell very well but that's more of a marketing and it being an Epic Game Store exclusive related problem. Doesn't change the fact that more than a decade later, people still resonate with the story that Alan Wake is trying to tell. It's what leaves us wanting more. This feels like the best place to go over some housekeeping things. The gameplay footage will be from the original PC release and not the 2021 remaster. This is because the remaster somehow looks worse than the original game. Uh, Alan Wake, uh, is left looking like a, a real life Clayface type guy. And instead of overdosing on blasting through all of Alan Wake, I gave myself a slow but steady drip of morphine for my experience of the game. Alan Wake is presented to us in an episodic format compiling of six episodes and two DLC episodes that are presented to us as special features. I would play an episode of the game and then shelf the game for a couple days. This allowed myself to digest the game and really think about what it is that I just played. I think doing that played to the game's strengths more than blitzing the game like some kind of uncultured swine. Alan Wake is easily one of my top three favorite games of all time and has been since I first played it on that last weekend of May in 2010. Though with nobody I know having never played the game, I did, never had anyone to talk about it with. Hence, this monstrous video in which I'll talk about all of the game uninterrupted. If I were to list maybe 10 of my favorite games, I'd feel in incredibly confident that I've played those games again in some form or fashion. Yet, a game I hold in higher regard than at least 7 of those games, I've only played once. I can't explain why I've only played it once. I mean, I can. It's pretty simple. Alan Wake influenced me a lot. 
And I was worried if I played it again, I'd worry that I didn't like it as much as I did. Which means I never played its DLC. Something I didn't know existed until I did it for this review. I also never played American Nightmare because it wasn't a true sequel to Alan Wake, and therefore I didn't think it was relevant to play. That changed when I did play it for this review and realizes it teaches us a lot of important things about the mythos of Alan Wake. Look, if you want to turn this all off now, here is what I have to say in short about playing Alan Wake for the first time in 12 years. That game still rips. I love it for all the same reasons I did when I was 18 and for so many new reasons. My lord, what a game universe Remedy created. Despite my love for this game holding true, I do have criticisms that I didn't have when I first played it, and it's mainly focused on the combat. It's incredibly shallow, which gets incredibly repetitive. I'd argue that all other games' core mechanics are pretty repetitive, but this is getting into an argument about how a game's gameplay loop engages with the players, so let's just stick to the combat of Alan Wake for right now. The combat is remarkably plain. The main enemy, the Taken, are shrouded in darkness, and firing at them with your gun won't damage them or slow their down their gate as they stalk towards you. You must shine your flashlight at them for a certain amount of time until you've washed away that darkness, allowing you to express your second amendment right. Sure, you can speed up that process by aiming down sights to make sure their darkness shield goes down faster, or you could take a slower approach, casually shining your light on them only to aim down sights to cancel their attack animation. But Doing the latter is slow and tedious. It disrupts the flow of getting to the story beats, which are more important to the game. There is a way for the combat to not feel that way. It's in the way Remedy chose to structure the game. If you play the game as Remedy presents it, playing an episode of the game every couple days, the combat doesn't really feel stale. Only going through the gameplay loop two hours every couple of days makes it more palatable, rather than blitzing through the game in larger chunks. To circle back to how all games are repetitive, Control's problem is that the most efficient way to kill guys is to throw rocks at them as a base primitive instinct, something that the game encourages you to do. There is a skill tree that makes you throw rocks stronger while it's more challenging to make your gun a viable option at that same pace. Fortnite is an incredibly repetitive game, Search, build, kill. Though, it stands as one of, if not the most popular game currently. Though, dealing with different people each round might add to the spice of the, the game's format. You can even argue that God of War suffers the same fate. The devs even recognized this. They've added puzzles to the game to break up combat zones and story beats. These have been met with very mixed reviews. These are the challenges all developers deal with when designing a game. Remedy has opted to ignore those challenges and just let their gameplay loop feel relatively flat. This isn't a slight on Control or Alan Wake or any of the other Remedy games, for that matter. Thinking big picture, playing Remedy games isn't about combat. It's about it everything else. Alan Wake is stuffed full of world building, story and character progression. That is the draw of the game, to be bathed in the light of a good narrative. I made a joke on Twitter that said, Alan Wake is for people who are, I see video games as art types. <laughs> I guess the joke became reality for me in my opinion. Alan Wake's actual biggest flaw is that if you aren't immersed in the story, it's trying to tell you, you're going to notice these problems it has as a video game. If you want an actual game design choice that is bad and affects the gameplay, it's this. In relation to the third person camera that Alan Wake has, Alan Wake the guy is like in an awkward spot. Alan is almost dead center. You can make the argument that if Remedy added a reticle to help us aim better, Alan's body would be covering it. 
The game actually has a reticle. It's essentially the flashlight, but that's besides the point. In 2010, I was very unfamiliar with the third person genre, so any idea of it looking wrong or off didn't exist. Playing Alan Wake in 2022 is when I noticed it. Controlling Alan felt off as a result of this, and it took for the first chapter until I got used to it. Let me tell you, using a keyboard the control Alan is a weird experience. He never walks in that straight line you want him to walk in. He's almost always walking at like a 45 degree angle to the left. Between the combat and this issue, I feel the placement of the camera and Alan Wake himself are bigger issues than the combat being stale or repetitive. Remedy knows combat isn't the draw of the game. This is shown by the lack of boss fights in the game. The closest we get to is the fight with the Dark Presence before diving into the lake at the end of the game. Though that fight is just firing a couple flares so you can get close enough to dive into the lake. There isn't some large health bar enemy to deal with. It's always the little strays you have to deal with. Sure, I would have liked to have dealt with human antagonists, therapist Emil Hartman and FBI agent Nightingale on my own terms, but it makes more sense for Alan to not take them out. It would feel weird to just kill regular guys as a regular guy yourself, even if those guys suck. Alan Wake isn't some action star. He's a writer from New York. Rumor has it is that he's an abusive person with rage problems. We learn that Alan has had a couple of altercations with the media in his past, and there's even more nefarious rumors that Alan Wake is a serial killer. How else could he write such grisly crime novels? What we learn in American Nightmare is that Alan Wake is just a good and loving husband and is incredibly normal. He just hates paparazzis, but I get that. At the end of the day, Alan Wake is just a writer who doesn't go running in the woods shooting a gun. He even says as much in the game. So when Alan shoots his revolver and has to reload, he takes an agonizing long time to reload the gun. Heck, Wake isn't even much of a runner. Alan Wake can only run mm, three feet before his... Smoker lung, which I can only assume is making this problem uh, uh, exist, makes him start huffing and puffing. I think that also explains one of the more confounding gameplay choices Remedy made in the game. In Alan Wake, in order to run, you have to press whichever button it is mapped to. But also, if you want to dodge an attack, it's the same button as the run button. So if you're running and you're about to get hit, you have to stop running and then you dodge. You can run out of the dodge animation if you just hold down the button, which creates one of the goofiest run animations or at least startup animations. Because even if there are no enemies around, Wake will still do the dodge animation before he runs in most cases. This is something that Remedy even made fun of in the trailer for American Nightmare. Still looks as goofy dodging in flannel as he did when he wore a jacket with elbow patches. <sighs> goofy, you got that right. It works. Alan Wake is an uncoordinated buffoon, so him trying to run and dodge should look and feel bad. He's not gracefully sliding over car hoods or leaping over tall fences but you're not really jumping a whole lot because that's not the point. Look, he is somewhat of an asshole, though that might just be to those he dislikes. He locks Emil Hartman in his office to get swept up by the Dark Present with a little smirk on his face. Alan Wake is a complicated character, being selfish, but at the same time being a good person to those he loves. Alice Wake, his wife, even made a movie about who he is after the events of the game to sway public perception to a more positive light. Alan is the perfect guy for us to pilot in this psychological thriller, a big city guy lost in the woods. 
While talking about Alan Wake, I do not want to gloss over the characters you meet along your journey. Each person in the game feels real. This isn't just a testament to Remedy's writing, but also to the performances given by the actors. Barry Wheeler is one of, if not the best character in the game. Alan Wake might be a city boy, but Barry Wheeler encompasses everything that is the boisterousness of New York. He clashes with the vibe and aesthetic of Bright Falls. While the color palette of the game is very very muted and drab colors, Barry stands out in every way possible. He's wearing a big bright red puffer jacket. This is in contrast to the other person on Alan's side, Sheriff Sarah Breaker, who is the polar opposite of Barry Wheeler. She's a very serious character and wants to do everything by the books. This is shown in chapter 3 when she's clashing with how Nightingale wants to attack Alan Wake. Though when she joins Alan's side in chapter 5, she takes the same approach to the Taken as Wake does with a flashlight and a gun. This is in contrast to Barry Wheeler who wraps himself up in Christmas lights. And this isn't just the regular small white Christmas lights, but the big bulbed colorful ones. And when Barry saves you in that same chapter, he's not using a regular gun, it's a flare gun. Circling back to Agent Nightingale, he and Emil Hartman are great foils to Alan Wake. The first wanting to arrest him because of some knowledge he has that Wake is doing something wrong. The second wanting to harness the power of the lake with the use of Alan Wake at his side. A funny trait about Agent Nightingale is that every interaction he has with Alan Wake, he refers to Wake by a different famous writer. Stop Hemingway! Right, James Joyce. It's you now, Raymond Chandler. Hear me in there, Brett Easton Ellis. Huh? Get back in the cell, Stephen King! I know this is mentioned by just about anyone who's ever written or talked about Agent Nightingale and the game, but a good bit is a good bit. You could argue that Nightingale and Hartman represents the bright and dark presence in some capacity. Hartman wants to mold Alan Wake into a puppet for him to utilize the power of Cauldron Lake, whereas Nightingale wants Alan Wake to have nothing to do with the lake at all. Even outside the main players you meet, everyone else feels so fleshed out. Between Rose, the landlord, and the park ranger, everyone feels very real and fleshed out even if you interact with them for such a small amount of time. Throughout the game, you can find radios where you'll hear the local radio station, Pat Main educating us on the surrounding area and local events happening. Each character is crafted with not only the purpose of serving the story, but fleshing out the world that surrounds Alan Wake. Alan Wake takes place in the logging town of Bright Falls, which rests on Cauldron Lake. The game is split in two distinct color palettes. The first is what takes place during the day. Everything is vibrant and alive. These sections take their time and they're more expository and let you be more relaxed. This is because you aren't in any danger of being attacked. The second and the one that takes up the majority of the game is what happens at night. When everything shifts to a lot of dark blues and grays, the woods are almost indistinguishable from segment to segment, only broken up by specific set pieces they have in any given area. At night, the world is devoid of almost any bright color. The only time you get any is when you're in a room where the lights are on. The only time you get a true warm color is when you create it by lighting off a flare. The game explodes in reds and oranges, almost overexposing your point of view and forcing your eyes to adjust to the harsh light you've created. Flares are useful, seeing as they ward off incoming Taken. The same can be said when you fire the flare gun, but instead of being assaulted by the light yourself, you watch the world become illuminated by the assault instead. It's really also beautiful. There is something poetic about the application of the flare and flare gun in Alan Wake. Flares are used as signals of distress. At least that's how we perceive them and how media presents them. There are also, you know, defensive flares we see in many war inspired movies when they use flares to get missiles off their backs. In Alan Wake, the standalone flares serve as a similar purpose. When you pop a flare and the surrounding area around Alan is engulfed with its light, it wards off advancing Taken. The light, though, also acts as an offensive tool. The flare is an area effect weapon allowing you to deal with multiple Taken shields at once. 
It's both defensive, warding off Taken, and offensive, eroding the Taken shield. The flare gun in real life is a call for help, using it to alert people of one's survival and location. But in Alan Wake, it is the ultimate offensive tool. Upon firing, Remedy implements their bread and butter effect, a cinematic slow motion. The camera follows the flare's flight path as it crashes into a Taken as they explode in a flourish. It's in these moments where you, the player, feel more empowered than you do if you were just to use some of the just regular better weapons like the shotgun or the hunting rifle or even the flash grenade. Those items, though, are considered a luxury since who knows when you'll find those resources again. Being a game with a finite amount of ammo, I say finite, they're like, you can just pick up infinite revolver ammo at some points, but that's besides the point. We, the player, fall into a classic video game trick. Much like when playing other games with restorative items, Final Fantasy and its Phoenix Downs, or ammo for your weapons in a Resident Evil game, we worry about those resources. We uh, trick ourselves, thinking that we need to preserve these precious goods, often saying to ourselves, uh, 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 I'll save this for later when I really need it, only for that moment to never really come out. I mean, at least we think that moment never comes. Let me tell you a thing about that way of thinking. It's wrong and bad. It's a bad way of playing games. I hate to be someone who tells people how to play games, but there is something broken in our ape brains that make us think like that. I lo look, I'm someone who also thought like that until I played Alan Wake this time around. You run around the woods getting stronger flashlights, batteries for those flashlights, and better guns. Though, at points in the game, whatever you've collected can and will get taken away from you, leaving you with just the bare essentials, a dinky little flashlight and a revolver. People even complained about this mechanic, but if you think about it in a story sense, it makes sense how and why Alan would lose these objects. This then incentivizes us to use our better weapons, the stronger guns, and aim down sights to waste batteries of our flashlights more often. Who knows when you'll lose your tools and when you'll get them back. Might as well survive as easy as possible now while you have a shotgun. Might as well use the flare gun while it lasts and get at my slow-mo shots where I can get them. Remedy does those moments so well in their games, building a scene where a flare illuminates the screen and the music hits and the player feels unstoppable. It's why I say people should get to the ashtray maze portion of control because you are running around not just in a maze, but in a creative use of space while shredding that game's enemies, the hiss. In Alan Wake, that moment is in chapter four, the truth. After making their escape from Hartman's Lodge with Alan's manager, Barry Wheeler, and the knowledge to go to the Anderson's farm, uh, older musicians met in the earlier portion of the game, Alan and Barry get separated. You make your way to the farm, fighting off the Taken with what little you have to your name, wondering the fate of Barry. As you approach the farm, you see a stage, and there's Barry behind the consoles. You are swarmed by the Taken from all angles, but Barry provides lights from the stage and pyrotechnics that are set up all along the farm grounds in front of the stage. The stage at the Anderson farm is a great set piece for providing that moment. It's in direct contrast to the rest of the game. It's loud and bombastic rather than the eerie natural sounds of the forest. 
You can see this in chapter three when you go to the old mine. It's the one time you get to roam around the forest of Bright Falls during the day, seeing it in a new perspective and getting a chance to breathe in while casually walking through the woods for once. You could just drive all the way there, assuming you're smart enough to get back into the car you used in the cinematic. Who'd be dumb enough to not think they couldn't use the car to drive again? Driving on the dirt road still gives you a big sense of how Bright Falls feels like a real place. Scrapping the open world aspect did remedy a lot of favors. A lot of the set pieces were built and they were able to slot them in as a break for the player's eyes while trouncing through the woods. Whether it be a sawmill, or an abandoned mansion, or a crashed plane, or even getting uh, uh, the chance to explore what you could of Bright Falls in Chapter 5 with the Sheriff Sarah Breaker, a place that is of most importance is the lake itself. As we later learn in Control, Cauldron Lake is known as a place of power. In Control, the main building you are in, the oldest house, we discovered the oldest house while investigating a suspected altered world event case in the New York City subway tunnels. The agents found their way up into the building. Once we became aware of it, it was there. For the rest of the population, it was hiding in plain sight, a slippery blind spot, seemingly discouraging observation. It's a, a place of power, an ongoing AWE of its own seemingly adhering to its physical outer constraints and yet constantly breaking the known boundaries of reality. It's, it's unstable, shifting. Now you could say all places existed, whether or not you have knowledge of it. Uh, the, the, the Great Pyramids are always gonna be in Egypt. Dodger Stadium is gonna be in Los Angeles. My grocery store is gonna be down the street from me, whether you know about those things existing or not. The difference is that the oldest house just can't be observed. Cauldron Lake's power is that it brings fiction, works of art, and even rumors to life. What it brings to life has to logically makes sense within the medium the tale is being told. There is some debate about whether it can or cannot bring things into existence, but there isn't a ton of information on if that's true. Cauldron Lake also houses cosmic beings, the bright and dark presences. These two are represented by Thomas Zane and Barbara Jagger and the Taken, respectively. We'll get into the cosmic horror that is Cauldron Lake a little later. Remy does a good job making the woods feel open, but making you feel claustrophobic when thrown into a combat zone. In the woods, you'll find a rundown mansion. When exploring it, the ground collapses underneath you, revealing enemies beneath, leaving you surrounded. Talking about how great the individual set pieces that are scattered around Bright Falls as a break from the woods shouldn't downplay how the woods I hate using this word, feels? There is no worry about actually being lost while in the woods. The sections are open zones, but you can feel your way to the critical path. Even if you feel turned around, they do a good job of using landmarks so you know exactly where you should be going. The game does have a minimap, but it has no topography. You can't even bring up a real map to see if you're generally on the right path. It actually rules. Since it's gotten to the point where games naturally provide a minimap in some form to guide you to the critical mission or even a custom waypoint for you to travel to, we've grown accustomed to using it as a crutch for getting around a map. We've become weak as a result of it. The emptiness of the minimap enables the player to experience the environmental storytelling the game has to offer while still having a guiding light to the general area of where you need to be. The breadcoming Alan does to naturally guide the player is crucial for player immersion. Most games could probably learn from it. That's what Remedy does, drawing you in and wanting you to explore the world that is facilitating the story. In an age where developers are kind of forcing the issue on games being like movies or TV shows. See God of War or the Naughty Dog games. What I mean when I say this is that 
the seamless transition between cutscene and gameplay to mimic an actual movie, this uh, problem phenomenon, it, it can be seen when video games are being adapted into TV shows, but the creators of the games are downplaying the video game because we get to have less violence in a TV show and the viewers can still be engaged. The discussion is nuanced. Heck, Congress had this discussion 30 years ago. But if you think having a large abundance of violence is the only way to keep players engaged, then I think you need to have a hard look at your game to figure out why it needs to be that way. Just spitballing ideas here, you could scale back level design to eliminate a number of combat zones while still having a well-paced story and hitting all those extra moments you've naturally placed in, in your story. Seems like you made a big game just because big, I mean big map, is the marker of a triple-A video game. Sure, a big part of the gameplay loop of Alan Wake is violence, but that isn't what's keeping players going. <laughs> hey, did you know that AMC bought the rights to an Alan Wake TV show and it's currently in development? This isn't related to anything I just said. Now, this is the point of no return. I am about to go into the story of Alan Wake. Everything that is included in that and detailing the Remedy Connected universe and how Alan Wake is at the center of it. This is to make sure that we are all operating with the same knowledge when I talk about story concepts. How Remedy has woven a very large narrative across multiple games and pieces of media. So, if you want to play the story of Alan Wake or any of its other material or control, you should stop now. Otherwise, it's scare store time. <laughs> Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. Remedy calls this Alan Wake. It is 2010. Alan Wake is driving late at night and smashes a hitchhiker in the middle of the road. Funny thing is, that dude didn't get got. He is possessed and proceeds to chase Alan through the woods. Alan sees some guy beckoning him into a cabin. Unfortunately for the boy, he gets eviscerated by the hitchhiker. Thanks to the help of some talking light, Alan learns to defend himself using an energizer flashlight makes these shadowy men susceptible to the United States Nindo, the right to bear arms. Good thing Alan's spiritual advisor is Thomas Zane, a poet who may or may not have existed. Alan is then chased by a hurricane made of darkness to the only safe place, a lighthouse. Though even that proves to not be safe for long. Alan, it's time to wake up from your American nightmare. Alan wakes up in his Lincoln, Hell yeah, an American car. Dog bless the US of A. He and his wife Alice are taking a vacation to Bright Falls, hoping it will help with Alan's recent bout with writer's block. Bright Falls is a lake town inside a volcano and nothing weird has ever happened there. Alan goes to get the keys to their Airbnb at a diner. There he meets a big Alan Wakehead, Rose, and a cop doing a Twin Peaks bit. Try the coffee. I will not be talking about Twin Peaks in this review. Also two old men who think Alan is some dude named Tom. Alan ignores them trying to find Carl Stuckey to get the keys to his cabin. The lights are out in the back and a lady with a lantern tells him the dark is scary, but Alan is a man so the dark isn't scary at all. Carl isn't back there but luckily a woman who looks like she just got out of a funeral provides him with the keys. Alan gets picked up and he and his wife head to their cabin. Carl Stuckey barrels out of the diner with the actual keys. At the cabin, Alan turns on the generator to provide light to the cabin since Alice is deathly afraid of the dark. Once inside, Alice has a little surprise to show Alan. Much to his dismay, it's not a good time. It's a typewriter. Alice tricked him. 
This vacation is actually therapy. And a therapist she knows of lives here? Alan is a straight white man and doesn't have to take this. He storms off into the dark where Alice won't follow him. Very straight white male of him. Alan wants the only thing that can calm him down. The newly released KFC Double Down. He's got two of everything. Two pieces of cheese, two pieces of bacon, and two pieces of chicken. So long, bun. Mm -hmm. Before he can even manage to get to his car, Alice screams. She's fallen into the lake, so Alan does the first thing that comes to a straight white manly mind. He jumps in. Alan wakes up in his car, but it's hanging off a cliff. He, of course, gets out just as it's falling. Alan makes his way to civilization. Along the way, there is a flash of white light and a manuscript page floats down. It's from Alan's next book, Departure, but he doesn't remember writing it. Carl Stuckey is heard from the woods screaming about hot dogs and salads. Monster is the best with no cooks. Monster dog is second best. The famous dog is... Chuck salad, though. A man like me needs a hefty meal. That's for the day. That isn't what Alan ordered, so he shoots him, remembering his dream. Using the light of Alan's life, a bullet. Alan gets a chance to call the police, but he can't say he murdered Carl Stuckley, only that his wife is missing and he needs to go back to the cabin. A cabin that hasn't been there in over 40 years. It's 2007 now, a flashback. Alan arrives home during a blizzard. Alice is working on press material for Alan's next book. The lights go out, scaring Alice. Alan checks the fuse box only to learn it's a blackout. They light candles and Alice demands Alan tell her a story. As a kid, Alan hated the dark, but his mother gave him a disconnected light switch to get over his fears. The clicker can turn off the dark. Alan gives Alice the clicker to help her with her own fear. When Alan wakes up, Alan is in the sheriff's office with the town doctor tending to him. Alan goes to find the sheriff, Sarah Breaker. She returns his Verizon cell phone. Alan gets a call from an unknown number. It's some guy who says he kidnapped Alice. The kidnapper tells him to meet at Lover's Peak at midnight. In a jail cell is a drunk man, but uh, Alan leaves on the lights because he is uh, considerate. Inside the station, the therapist, Emil Hartman, is there. Being the man that he is, Alan asserts his alpha status and assaults Hartman. Before Alan can get arrested, his agent, Barry Wheeler, arrives. Hartman doesn't press charges and Barry and Alan leave. Alan tells Barry everything. He's the only person he can trust in this town. Unfortunately, Barry thinks Alan has gone crazy. They get to a lodge where they rent a cabin from the park ranger. At night, Alan leaves the cabin towards Lover's Peak. Alan reaches the lodge again and sees that the ranger has been attacked and left with a broken leg. He tells Alan that it happened the same way it did on a piece of paper he read. Alan goes to turn on the power but hears the ranger screaming. When he gets back to the ranger, he sees that he's gone. Outside the lodge, Alan sees the ranger has been turned into a Taken and dispatches him quickly. While taking a gondola ride, it malfunctions, throwing Alan to the ground, losing his gun. Alan is surrounded by Taken but is saved by not the kidnapper. Good thing he is for sure not the kidnapper. Alan's new friend teams up with him to help Alan get to Lover's Peak. Alan provides the light and the guy provides the gun. At Lover's Peak, the guy reveals the twist. He is the kidnapper. He wants Alan's entire manuscript so he can edit it. Instead, Alan tackles him to get the guy's gun. They fall off Lover's Peak and get separated in the woods below. Alan gets to a logging site. Watch out for that chain, bud. Barry calls Alan to say that he is in Hitchcock's The Birds. Alan tells him to stay inside until he gets back. Alan finds a car and drives back to the cabin to fight the biggest terror of them all. Birds. Barry apologizes for not originally believing Alan's psycho story, but believes him now. Barry gets a call from Rose but she is speaking with no emotion. She has the manuscript and tells Alan to meet her at her place. Rose is with the funeral lady. Good girl. Guess they got a mommy-daughter deal going on? I'm not here to yuck someone's yum. Upon arrival, the landlord gets you to Rose's. Barry informs Alan that he tried to ask Jeeves about Thomas Zane, but nothing came back. But I ran a bunch of searches. 
couldn't find a single thing he wrote. Once they met with Rose, she gives them coffee while telling Alan that she'll be his new muse, thus implying that she doesn't have the manuscript. Turns out it's a honeypot and the coffee is drugged. Alan wakes up inside Rose's room to see a shrine dedicated to him. It's night and Alan leaves the trailer, Rose, a shell of herself, and Barry who is too fat for Alan to carry. At the front gate, the landlord called the cops, worried about Rose. The cops have an FBI agent with them who immediately opens fire and almost hits a civilian. Alan uses this moment to escape. Alan makes it all the way to the radio station where he meets the host. The cops are able to follow him and the FBI agent opens fire yet again, almost hitting the elderly radio host. Alan escapes again. Underneath a bridge, objects spring to life flying towards Alan, but he only needs the light to take them out. After a fight with a Tonka truck, Alan gets in a car and drives to the coal mine to meet with the kidnapper. In the morning, Alan gets out of the car for some reason, but then wisely gets right back in. Who would walk all the way there? Only a moron would do that. At the coal mine, Alan waits, thinking about what he would do to the kidnapper, but also thinking about all the things the kidnapper could do to Alice. As night falls, Alan gets a call telling him to meet the kidnapper at Mirror Peak. Over the railway and through the mines to Mirror Peak, Alan goes. Walking towards the kidnapper, Alan hears him talking to someone. There, Alan learns that the kidnapper never had Alice and he only used her to try to get the manuscript for his boss. The darkness reveals itself as a tornado, twisting and turning, swallowing the kidnapper. It then tries to get Alan, but Alan is able to fight it off with a flare. The tornado throws him off the landing and into the lake below. Alan sees Alice, him at the typewriter, and even Thomas Zane. The last thing Alan sees is someone saving him. As Alan wakes up, he sees Alice, but it morphs into Hartman. Hartman tells Alan that he's really been in his care this whole time. Apparently, Alan has been getting better and even started writing, which has been good for his recovery. Has been good for his recovery. After showing Alan around the clinic, a storm starts brewing. Hartman, the Anderson brothers, confuse Alan for Tom again and give Alan directions to their farm. Alan tries to write, but he hears a scuffle. The Anderson brothers have attacked a nurse. Alan uses this moment to take the nurse's keys to snoop around. Who cares about the help? He finds Barry locked in a room and Alan tells him to get the car. In Hartman's office, Alan finds all the manuscript pages he found. Hartman tells Alan that together, they could create something beautiful. The darkness starts to make its presence known. Alan then locks Hartman in the office to get swallowed whole. Alan smiles. Alan escapes the nuthouse by avoiding the darkness and running through a hedge maze. Alan and Barry drive off before they are forced off the road, separating the two. Alan reaches the cabin hoping to find Barry, but it's just the guy from the jail on his last breath. Alan takes his car and makes his way to the farm, where the fireworks show begins. In the Andersons' home, they listen to a song that guides Alan to where he needs to go. Alan and Barry get drunk. Alan dreams a dream, and it's not the one where time goes by nor that dream where dreamers often lie. It's the one where Alan has an out-of-body experience, watching the events of the first night at the cabin. He remembers jumping into the lake. After that, it's a blur. He sees himself get out of the lake and back into the cabin, being goaded by the funeral lady to write, how he could write Alice back, but realizes he has to escape. Thomas Zane frees Alan with his own light. As Alan begins to wake, he mumbles about how he did it, the FBI agent's there to arrest him. At night, Alan wakes up in jail. The FBI agent says Alan did the crime, and he has all the proof he needs. To his surprise, he is saying the words he just read on a piece of paper. The darkness appears to take him away. Sheriff Breaker, bearing witness to this, is now on Team Dark is Scary. Alan tells Breaker that he needs to get to Cynthia Weaver, that lady with the lantern. Alan and Breaker storm through Bright Falls to the mayor's office for the helicopter's keys. They go to rescue Barry, only to be saved by him. They get to the chopper and take off. Unfortunately, the birds are there to attack, knocking Alan out of the chopper. He hoofs it to the power plant on foot. Weaver reveals herself and tells Alan off for running around at night. She talks about Thomas Zane and how she used to love him, but he never had eyes for her. Inside a water pipe, Alan has reception and calls Barry to tell them where to go, but the chopper goes down. Being a good person for once, Alan goes to save them. Both Barry and Breaker are fine, but are fighting off Taken. Alan joins in. 
They get to the dam and Alan lets his friends in, but the entrance gets blocked. He runs on top of the dam while being chased by the darkness, but is saved by Weaver. Cynthia Weaver leads them to the well-lit room, where inside Alan finds a shoebox. The shoebox contains the clicker, the same one Alan gave Alice. There's also a page that details a memory Alan had as a child. How Alan was afraid of the dark, but his mom gave him a clicker that belonged to his dad. Being the imaginative seven-year-old that he is, Alan believed it had some magical powers. Alan now knows what to do. He has to dive back into Cauldron Lake. Another flashback. Two years ago, Alan wakes up hungover after being on a late night show. He watches himself to see he did a good enough job. Alice comes home and they get into an argument, but Alice is able to soothe what is bothering Alan, and he promises that after the press tour, they will go on vacation. Alan leaves the well-lit room, leaving everyone behind. Alan marches to Cauldron Lake, knowing he has to finish the story. You see, when he was saved by Thomas Zane the first time, Alan never had a chance to finish the story that is now becoming reality. After dodging boats, trains, and cars that the darkness throws at him, Alan stands face to swirling mass, face with the darkness. Alan fires flare after flare until he dives into the lake. Alan is in his apartment. Alice is telling him he had a nightmare. Alan knows this is some trick, a last ditch effort used by the dark presence to ensnare him. Alan uses the clicker to turn on the light. In the void, Zane tells Alan that they're almost done. Alan sees a doppelganger of himself. Zane tells Alan that that is Mr. and he isn't something to worry about. Alan is making his way back to the cabin but is unsure how to finish the story. Alan hears Alice telling him she doesn't love him anymore. Alan knows it's a trick. Then Alan hears about how Zane tried to kill his wife when she became the darkness's face. Inside the cabin, Alan sees Zane's wife, Barbara Jagger, the hole where Zane cut out her heart ever present. Alan walks up to her and turns on the light, eliminating her. Alan goes to the typewriter and finishes the story. Alan is now back to when Alice went missing. Alan still dives in after her and days pass. It's Steerfest and everyone is jovial, except Rose who is the new Cynthia Weaver and behind her is Agent Nightingale who seems to be the darkness' new face. Alice emerges from the water calling out for Alan. Unfortunately, Alan is still trapped in the dark place, but he realizes that it's not a lake. It's an ocean. Whoa, talk about a scare story! In regards to the ending cutscene of Alan Wake, there is something important to point out. During the cutscene, we see the people of Bright Falls celebrating Deerfest. Rose is seen looking scared, clutching a lantern. Behind her is Agent Nightingale, hoisted by darkness. The ending shows how cyclical life is and implants the idea of the Ouroboros being an important theme for the game. Before we get into that, I have a couple more tales to tell. The signal and the rider take place after the events of the main game. It's detailing Alan's struggle with residing in the dark place. His brain has been fractured, leaving two Alan wakes. The first is the one that speaks to Alan from the TV here, irrational and acting on impulse to survive. The other is the one that is rational and more human. It's really a more id, uh, the irrational and animalistic part of the psyche versus superego, the self-conscious part of the psyche type situation. Thomas Zane still guides Alan through the dark place to help repair his fractured mind. Alan traverses an ever-fracturing Bright Falls as he tries to follow the signal Zane is sending him. The id wake is still writing the story into existence, trying to stop Alan Wake and Zane. Zane tells Alan that if he can't stop Id Wake, it'll create a never-ending nightmare that'll swallow him whole. Alan destroys TVs that Id Wake is possessing, knocking Alan out. When waking up, Alan must traverse an even more distorted Bright Falls. Zane tells Alan that his mind is struggling to become whole and that is reflected in the dark place. This is really shown in a Ferris wheel labyrinth of Alan's life. Alan arrives at Hartman's office to watch a therapy session between Hartman and Id Wake. Hartman suggests that everything is just illusions of grandeur, and Alan is trying to cope with Alice leaving him. Id Wake agrees with this assessment and laments that he should just stay in the dark place. This is emphasized with a recording of Alice ripping into Alan and how she has nothing but hate for him. Alan understands it's all a trick. Now lucid, Alan hears Alice again, but her true feelings this time. At the cabin, Alan reaches out to his id self and becomes whole again. He understands that 
he can't survive like Zane did in the dark place and needs to escape. He begins to write his a sequel to Departure. My name is Alan Wake, and I'm a writer. Alan Wake's American Nightmare is proof that Alan's story, Return, didn't fucking work. American Nightmare takes place in a Night Springs episode that Alan wrote when he worked on the show, just tweaked for his situation. In it, Alan is in Arizona. What an actual fucking nightmare. Trying to stop Mr. The first stop is at a motel leaking darkness. Alan closes up the hole using a manuscript page and gets the keys to Mr. Scratch's motel room, which leads Alan to an observatory. There, Alan must get a signal from space, but before he can get it, he needs to run errands for the scientist. Unfortunately, Alan only receives part of the signal. The last stop is a drive-in where Alan must turn on the power and set up the projection room. Alan is then taunted by Mr. and sent to the beginning of the story. Alan completes the loop two more times where each time through it's a little easier with the help of his friends and what he's learned from the other iterations. The third and last time in the projection room, Alan starts the projector that plays Alice's movie Sunrise, which eliminates Mr. This episode of Night Springs hasn't freed Alan, but it helps alleviate the nightmare that is Mr. Hold on. I'm trying to think of how to explain the main story of Control in as few words as possible, since I can't get into that whole other game because it's completely different, but there is a relevant bit in the DLC AWE. AWE stands for Altered World Event. You learn it in the DLC. Control is the story of Jesse Faden trying to find her brother only to get a job as the director of a secret government agency. Jesse must stop the Hiss, an unknown force that has invaded the oldest house and is possessing people. Uh, sound familiar? Jesse is protected thanks to being already possessed by a good being, Polaris. Jesse's job is to stop a full Hiss invasion and restore order to the Federal Bureau of Control. I think that does a, a good job explaining what happens in Control without really spoiling the game. Once completed, Jesse gets a hotline call from Alan Wake telling her to go to the investigation sector of the oldest house. W what's a hotline call? Well, this isn't the Control review, so I don't have to tell you. The page was discovered in an instance of the Ocean View Motel and Casino that was linked to the investigation sector. The page has been pushed into the motel's corridor from under the door with the symbol of a spiral. Text transcribed from the item. For ten years, I've tried to write my escape, only sinking deeper. I used to know where fiction ends and reality begins. Here... They are all the same. It's a hideous trap. My every thought made real. Fear. Desire. How can I ever know for sure I've escaped and not just lost in my own fantasy of it? That thought alone can drive you mad. Jesse follows Alan's voice and is taken to the Ocean View Motel, a recurring location in Control. There, Jesse sees Alan talking to Zane, but he looks like Alan now and is a filmmaker. Zane tells Alan that they've been working together, and they found their way out. Alan is still worried about Mr. but Zane tells him he's dealing with him. In the investigation sector, Jesse learns it has been shut down because a Taken and his infected Hartman went on a rampage. The third thing. The sound made darker, the darkness made louder. Hartman was stretched like a worm through time. The third thing was a monster. Now we crashed out of darkness toward Faden. Jesse defeats Hartman by utilizing the light and her funny gun. Jesse sees Wake again. He is mumbling about how someone is coming, and he has to escape by then. Alan created the hiss in order to give a hero a conflict to solve. At the end, an alarm sounds in the investigation sector. It's a warning of an incoming altered world event at Cauldron Lake. It states that it will take place in a couple years, and that this is just a warning. Wow! Glad I went over all of that so we can finally move on. Move on to the extracurricular material related to Alan Wake, which includes two comics, a book, and a blog, and a miniseries. 
The two comics take place at some point after Chapter 5 of Alan Wake. Night Springs follows Sarah Breaker's father, Frank, as he tries to get everything in order to deal with the Dark Presence. This shows that he has some working knowledge of the power of Cauldron Lake, or at least that something isn't right in the area. Frank has the sheriff splits up to go check on very important parts of Bright Falls, and he also has the radio host, Pat Main, ready to give an evacuation order if needed. Frank goes after his daughter only to be swarmed by Taken, but at that moment, Alan uses the clicker to saving Frank. Frank makes it to Sarah relieved to see her perfectly fine, and relishes in the idea that even if everything goes to shit, at least he gets to spend it with his daughter. The second comic psycho thriller follows Hartman after the attack at his lodge. A Taken Mott, the kidnapper, tries to kill Hartman. Hartman grabs a shoebox and he and a nurse try to escape. The sheriffs show up and they deal with Mott with the help of Hartman. Hartman refuses to be taken in by the sheriffs. Hartman calls an unknown number asking if he can stay with them. These stories are uh, relevant for different reasons. Though it's not clear until Control, the first implies the existence of the FBC. Breaker calls Kirkland, who at the time was the head of the investigation sector for the FBC before the Hartman incident. Speaking of, the phone call Hartman makes is presumably to the FBC. In Control, there is a voice recording of an interview with him, which ends in his arrest. As I stated in my written proposal, I believe working alongside your organization could be greatly beneficial to both parties. Sharing notes, as they say. Thank you, Doctor. That's all we need to hear. Remy? Dr. Emil Hartman, you have been found in breach of codes 4, 8, and 74 of the Federal Bureau of Control Criminal Offenses. What? You can't do this? I am a well-connected man. You're making a dire mistake, my friend. You will be detained until further notice and all personal property will be confiscated, including the Cauldron Lake Lodge. Hartman is eventually released as a non-threat. This leads to him diving into Cauldron Lake since he sees himself as more an expert and more suited to handle the dark place than Wake or Zane. He was wrong and the lake spits him out as a Taken, which, you know, leads to the FBC containing him, thus leading him to the rampage in the investigation sector. Dr. Hartman is the first Type 2 shaded individual to be examined alive by the Bureau and has proven a valuable asset for our understanding of A-010, a.k.a. The Shadow. Like all shaded individuals, the specimen is constantly shielded by or produces a of darkness that makes visual observation difficult. This also protects the specimen from harm. During testing, Non-lethal ballistics proved ineffective against it. The specimen uses words and phrases that seem to originate from its previous life as a therapist. Some phrases have even been identified as quotes from Dr. Hartman's book, The Creator's Dilemma. This seems to indicate the host personality remains to some degree. For research purposes, Shaded Hartman was relocated to the Cauldron Lake Lodge replica built for the... AWE investigation. Researchers hope a familiar setting may trigger new behavior. This experiment has yielded no results thus far. Refer to file 5-22-1019 for full report. The Alan Wake Files is a book that came with the collector's edition of Alan Wake. It is a fictional book written by Clay Stewart. Um, if you don't know who Clay Stewart was, that was the guy who Alan meets in his dream at the start of the game. I know it's very confusing, but I'll explain it uh, in a little bit. The book is a collection of material found by Clay as he does his own investigation. He collected notes from Nightingale, mostly about his distaste for the town, how he thinks Alan is some corrupt, insano criminal, a lot of interviews Nightingale had done with residents of Bright Falls. There isn't much of importance here, except a little context that Nightingale has a little personal stake here. Nightingale used to have a partner who became very scared of the dark and very wary of even being in the dark, and he told Nightingale this very much when he died. Clay did reach out to the FBI only to learn that Nightingale was there on unofficial business. Clay also found manuscript pages that detail people's lives. I want to note that Alan was only in town for like a day before he wrote the manuscript, so how he knew of these people or their memories is a mystery. 
This is to serve to reinforce the power Cauldron Lake has in regards to bringing fiction to life. Clay also compiled a couple of Wake stories that he found in Bright Falls, a short story and the first chapter from the third Alex Casey books. More on Alex Casey in a second, I promise. There was also an excerpt from Hartman's self-help book about how he tries to treat his patients. The last section is about Bright Falls itself, how some weird things tend to happen in the area. Bigfoot makes appearance, birds look weird, and there's even some notes about the Taken. Clay found material about Divers Island, Barbara Jagger, and Alan Wake himself. What led Clay to do this is the most interesting bit. He had recurring dreams about him and a man being chased by darkness. He sees an interview with Alan and realizes that that's the guy from his dream. He doesn't know how Alan was in his dream sing as he had no idea who Alan was before his dreams started. He becomes obsessed with his dreams, which sets him off to Bright Falls, leaving behind his wife and kid. His wife tells him not to look for them when he eventually comes back. When he learns that Alan has disappeared in Bright Falls, that's what prompts him to start his book. When his leads run out, he returns home and reaches out to his wife. Clay gets a job at a university library. The students look at him weird, but he doesn't really pay them any attention. This is because the students don't understand or know what Clay knows. That when he returns home and walks up his stairs and open his apartment door, there he sees his wife and kid and he's bathed in the bright light. They don't understand that Clay's untouchable because of how he's embraced by this light. This House of Dreams was an ARG, an alternate reality game, blog. The author Samantha is writing a blog about how she's turning a house she's bought into her dream home. During renovations, she finds a shoebox with photos and poems inside. That night, she has a dream of a federal agent asking about the shoebox. When she wakes up, the shoebox is gone. Luckily, she has photos of the contents of the box. The photos are of a man putting on a diving suit while his girlfriend and lover is with them. The poems were written by, we can only assume, Thomas Zane. One of the poems is what Hartman has engraved on a plaque at his lodge. This confirms the shoebox was similar to the one in the well-lit room. Samantha has another dream. It's about a man in an old-fashioned jacket with elbow patches. The man was mumbling about how the house she was in was too dark. He was very concerned with the lack of light, so much so that he ignored everything she was trying to say to him. When she woke up, she saw a dark figure outside her window scaring her. This leads her to getting lights all around the property of her house. One day, someone, or something, breaks into the house, scaring Samantha into calling the cops. Samantha then gets a threatening phone call about the shoebox and what people would do to get their hands on it. She stands firm that she will not be scared away from her house. Then, the shoebox reappears with more poems inside. Also inside was a large antique light switch. When she tests it, the power in the whole town goes out. That is the only time it happened. She then has another dream. This time, a man in a diving suit telling her a story about how he tried to bring his lover back to life, but only brought back a monster wearing her face. He tried to cut out its heart, but there was nothing there, so he dove into the lake with it in tow. As he was sinking, he recited a master poem, creating a pocket dimension where he and his lover could actually be happy. Uh, if I, if I could create a, a, a dimension, it'd be a hot pocket dimension. This master poem wrote him out of existence, but made a rule where everything he left in shoeboxes would remain. In the depths of the lake, his body was possessed by a bright presence, much like how his lover was possessed. There, the two would continue to fight the war that's been going on for years. When she wakes up, Samantha feels privileged to know that information. She understands that something is coming even if she doesn't know what. One of the pages in the shoebox is the title page to Alan's second book, Return, reinforcing what we learned in American Nightmare, that Alan is still stuck. Also, on the page, Alan's made a note of the monomyth, the hero's journey. Have you ever seen Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? Those are primo examples of the hero's journey. Alan Wake had emphasis on the second stage, initiation. Also fun to note that this House of Dreams takes place in Ordinary, Maine, the same place where Jesse Faden is from and where she and her brother had triggered an AWE of their own. In American Nightmare, one of the songs used is By the Old Gods of Asgard, the Anderson's band. 
The song that they use, it states that... Which is either about what Jesse did or potential Alan Wake 2 or about this house of dreams where she turned out all the lights. Bright Falls was a six-part miniseries that was a prologue to Alan Wake. It follows journalist Jake Fisher who travels there to interview Emile Hartman. It details Jake experiencing an odd series of events. During his interview with Hartman, Jake spaces out while writing his notes and begins to hallucinate. When he comes to, the interview's over and Hartman is escorting Jake out. While driving back to his motel, he looks at his notes, only to see incoherent nonsense. The next morning, when Jake wakes up, he's in the middle of the woods. Confused, Jake goes to see his friend who works at the local paper. His friend tells him that he's done with the article, he should leave now and get home safely. At the diner, Jake sees a crazed woman trying to break a streetlight with some rocks until she then bites the sheriff. When Jake looks at the TV in the diner, he blacks out again, having similar hallucinations to when he interviewed Hartman. Jake goes back to see Hartman to get the book signed. He tells Hartman what's been happening to him. Then, Hartman takes out a penlight and shines it in his eyes. Jake freaks out. In his motel room, Jake sets up his camera to record him as he restrains himself. The next morning, his restraints are broken and his room has been trashed. A sheriff knocks on his door to inquire about the missing owner of the motel. When the cop sees the trashed room, the cop says it must have been a big deer that did this. Jake then asks his friend to drive him out of town. During the drive, his friend tries to get his attention. There's a quick cut, then Jake is driving, with his friend nowhere to be seen. Only her shoe on the floor of the car with some blood on it. Jake stops the car, and as night falls, he disappears from inside it. As the cops investigate the car, Alan and Alice drive by as they enter Bright Falls. As it stands, we have no idea what has happened to Jake, even 12 years later. We can be a little speculative while taking a look at his deranged notes. Jake wrote that he has arranged his legacy and that he will be the first and only to make it through, whatever any of that means. We can maybe assume that he became a Taken, but the director of the show has pushed against that idea. It stands to reason that he has been touched by the Dark Presence in some fashion though. With covering Alan Wake's story in semi-extensive fashion, it's time to talk about Remedy's connected universe. I earlier made a joke that Remedy answered the question, what if someone just built a game studio on postmodern literature? But it really is true. The foundations are all over Remedy's games. Their use of irony and black humor. Think how Hartman gaslights Alan into thinking he's been in the lodge the whole time. Metafiction, Alan writing his story and then proceeding to live that story. Temporal distortion, Alan waking up losing a week of his life while writing in the dark place. Uh, also intertextuality, there is a lot going on there just to name a few. <sighs> Fine, I'll say a little about intertextuality as it seems to be kind of a big buzzword or at least a, a tool used extensively at this point. Intertextuality is the idea that individual pieces of work are not self-contained. You can see this in any studio that has a, a cinematic universe, though their use of intertextuality is very different from how postmodernism uses it. In movies nowadays, it's used in reference. Hey, remember when this moment happened? Oh, whoa, don't want that happen just like when it happened that one time. Yeah, you know, things like that. The funny quips. It's not serving the story, but is serving fan service. They've even built in beats in the films to actually let the audiences have time to react to them. A lot of what this does is make moments feel earned in a forced manner. This is sort of why the Disney remakes of their animated films feel flat. Not saying it's a bastardized version of it, but more it has transformed into a new meaning. In postmodern literature, it's used as a device to weave together multiple works or genres into its own piece. If you've ever read Paul Auster's City of Glass, that's a prime example of it. Remedy uses intertextuality in both ways. When Remedy does self-reference themselves, it isn't to create moments for the audience to react to so that it derails the story. Those things are there, but only if you're willing to put in the work to find it. 
and they are self-serving for fleshing out the universe Remedy has created. I'm going to leave it at that before I lose the thread of this thing. Alan Wake is the fourth game Remedy created, released on May 14th, 2010. It signals the start of Remedy's connected universe, even if it wasn't cemented until Control was released nine years later. And while all their games are connected, that doesn't necessarily mean they take place on the uh, same plane of existence. This is due to real world issues of who owns the IP, though that hasn't stopped Remedy. I will try to keep this as organized as possible, but fair warning, this graph, or however I represent this, will look like an M.C. Escher piece that got ruined by John Madden using a telestrator. Let's start with Alan Wake. As stated, Alan Wake is the technical center of Remedy's Connected Universe, taking place in 2010. Most of, if not all of Remedy's games take place in the year they were released. We should backtrack and go in chronological order of the events of Alan Wake and kind of the history we know of uh, Bright Falls and everyone who takes part. In 1970, Barbara Jagger, Emil Hartman, and Thomas Zane went to Bright Falls and set up shop on Divers Island. At that time, the Anderson brothers and their band, the Old Gods of Asgods, were living on the farm where they'd rehearse. Also, they'd be making moonshine from Cauldron Lake's water. Then, the actual events of Samantha's last dream happen. Zane brought Barbara back, but she was possessed, so he dove into the lake with her and he made the pocket dimension, and his body was possessed. In 1976, there was another AWE. On the day of the flooding, the rock band, Old Gods of Asgard, was rehearsing in a field outside the Anderson farm, the homestead of band members Odin and Tor Anderson, both admitted to being in a heavy state of inebriation at the time, having spent, quote, days, unquote, drinking their home-brewed moonshine while celebrating Deerfest. After the townspeople were evacuated from the flooded field, Sheriff Breaker was asked by Freya Anderson, daughter of Tor Anderson, to check on her father and uncle. Breaker drove to the Anderson farm and found the band members alive, but in need of medical aid. Tor Anderson had been struck by lightning, and Odin Anderson had cut out his own right eye. Possible reference to Nord deities and They claimed they had fought and quote, valiantly defeated a dark army of the Scratching Hag, unquote, rising from Cauldron Lake, see AEW of 1970, related to the suspected at Diver's Isle. While impossible to verify, these events are relevant to the recurring AWE at Bright Falls and the Cauldron Lake. Odin and Tor Anderson have been listed as persons of interest. There was another AWE in 78, but we have no info on what took place. In 1985, Alan's mother gives him the clicker. That was from his father. This is the memory that Zane had written and placed in the shoebox. Remedy's first game, Death Rally, comes out in 1996. There isn't much connecting it to Alan Wake and its universe as a whole. Though this depends on how much yoga you want to do in order to make this stretch. There isn't much of a story in Death Rally, but to use up some of the empty space in the menu, Sam Link, current creative director of Remedy but then writer, wrote some dialogue in that space. It comes from a disembodied voice of someone called the real Tom Reimer, who speaks to you through a magic radio to help you along the way. Whoa, dude! That's almost like Thomas Zane, who used a typewriter and a shoebox to help us at the end of the game. Whoa! Tom is short for Thomas, so like, what if they're the same? They're not, it's just a number of coincidences more than anything else. Remedy tends to employ the same motifs and themes across all its games, so overlaps like this are bound to happen. Death Rally does make an appearance as an arcade cabinet in American Nightmare, but otherwise this game is inconsequential to the mythos of Remedy's universe. Your Alan Wake's universe? Whichever we're calling it. 
As an adult, Alan Wake's first professional job was writing for a TV show called Night Springs. Wake then wrote a series of books called Alex Casey. Alex Casey has a lot of similarities to Remedy's Max Payne games. We can argue, and we'd probably be right, that Alex Casey is Max Payne. There are a couple of clues proving this. The first is that the covers of the Alex Casey books are stylized in the same manner as the cover of Max Payne 2. The second is that in Alan Wake, you can find manuscript pages that are from the last Alex Casey book. Coincidentally, they follow a very similar story to Max Payne 2. And if you find those manuscript pages, when you view them, instead of Alan reading them, it's James McCaffrey reading it as Alex Casey. McCaffrey being the voice actor for Max Payne. The reason for a different name is because, as stated, Remedy sold the rights to the IP over to Rockstar. Before Alan Wake the game starts, we have Clay Stewart having his dreams that eventually leads him to going to Bright Falls. Then, a couple days before Alan and Alice arrive at Bright Falls, the mini-series of the same name begins. Jake Fisher disappears the same day Alan and Alice arrive. The events of Alan Wake happen, and while that's happening, Clay Stewart is also collecting material for his book during the time. On the second to last night, chapter 5 of the game, the events of Night Springs and Psycho Thriller occur. With the ending of Alan Wake, the two DLC episodes happen, though those happen on a different plane of existence, technically I guess. After Deerfest occurs in Bright Falls, the FBC arrive to investigate, which leads them to bringing in Hartman. At some point after the events of Alan Wake, but before the year 2012, the Old Guards of Asgard's reform with Barry Wheeler as their manager. In 2012, as Barry is sleeping, he leaves the TV on with Night Springs running. The episode that plays is the events of Alan Wake's American Nightmare. There is some discussion if it really happened or not. I believe it did happen, though it's hard what did and didn't happen constitutes as any change in the real world. Alan defeats Mr. Sk in the game, but as we know in the AWE DLC of Control, Mr. Sk is still out there. But it takes place in 2012, but it doesn't matter as time's irrelevant when you're trapped in solitary confinement that is at the dark place. I sort of glossed over Night Springs, so I'll let's go over it now. Night Springs is a Twilight Zone type show. In universe, Alan Wake wrote for it before he made it big with Alex Casey. In Alan Wake, you do get to watch some episodes of it. It's presented as an FMV, and coincidentally, the episodes in the game are parallels to the events of the game. This is so they can introduce themes and motifs to the player in order to give them a chance to follow along. Night Springs was cancelled, but at some point around 2019, maybe a year or two earlier, the FBC purchased the IP. This was to be used as propaganda to influence the general public's perception of AWEs. Based on the success of America Overnight, we would like to propose the creation of a television series that presents superstition and skeptical thought as entertainment in order to popularize these concepts among the civilian population and create less resistance to redirecting information regarding public paranatural events. We can also use a solid media outlet to test paranatural concepts on civilian audiences, seeing how they react to certain facts presented as fiction in the event that the Bureau ever decides to make certain realities public knowledge. There are various show licenses that we could purchase and reboot rather than start Starting from scratch. One particular property seems promising, especially considering its content and tone are precisely what we're looking for. It's called Night Springs and has been off the air for a few years now. In February of 2012, Samantha started her blog, This House of Dreams. It runs until July 29th, 2012. The FBC takes the shoebox. She has a dream featuring Alan Wake. The shoebox returns and then has a final dream involving Zane. In 2016, in conjunction with Microsoft Studios, Remedy to develops Quantum Break. This was released alongside a Quantum Break TV show for the Xbox streaming surface, something I had just learned existed just now. The IP is owned by Microsoft, but that didn't stop Remedy from leaving breadcrumbs to their previous works. Mary from The Lord of the Rings is seen wearing an Old Gods of Asgard shirt. 
Court. You can watch an episode of Night Springs in the game, and you can find a copy of Alan Wake's A Sudden Stop. More importantly, there is an FMV to watch that is of Alex Casey acting as an FBI agent and another agent trying to piece together what happened to Alan Wake and what happened in Bright Falls. Also seen in it is potentially Mr. Sc who apparently kills Alex Casey. There is also a chalkboard that is filled with theories about Alan Wake himself and what happened to him in the first level of Quantum Break. Some of these I'll get into as they answer some important questions or at least bring light to some of these questions and potential answers to them. It should be stated that Quantum Break isn't on the same plane as existence as Alan Wake. These connections were placed for fans of Alan Wake to find and enjoy. I want to make note that I think Quantum Break isn't as bad as game as everyone seems to make it out. I do wonder how much better it could have been if Microsoft didn't meddle too much into it and also force a tie-in TV show to it. It has really strong bones. Ultimately, the game sort of falls flat for a number of different reasons. That leads us to 2019, where the events of Control happen. A video game that answers the burning question, what if Quantum Break worked out? Let me tell you, it's an exceptional game, though I already spoke highly of it earlier. Obviously, we went over those events. What is of note from the story is how much influence Wake and his spooky typewriter had on the events of Control. It's a contentious topic for some because they don't like the idea that Alan Wake wrote the whole thing. That's completely understandable to me though. I do think that he didn't write the whole thing, but he did nudge events to go a certain way and maybe even happen earlier than intended. I said earlier that Alan invented the hiss. I think that's misleading. It's my belief that the hiss always existed and they were always going to invade, but how they invaded and acted was something manipulated by Wake. The hiss have an incantation. This was written by Wake. Alan Wake wrote down phrases, threw them in a shoebox, pulled them out, and then put them in order, thus creating a Dada's poem that the Hiss would just recite over and over. I think Wake had more a hand in writing the events of AWE than the main story. Obviously, the events of AWE directly relate to Alan himself, but this also helps Jesse restore the investigation sector, thus alerting the FBC of the incoming AWE as Cauldron Lake. In Control, the spokesman for the Hiss, Jesse's brother, Dylan, talks about his dreams. One about a private eye who was a character in a book, and another about a man named Mr. Door. These aren't just dreams, but Dylan moving through other timelines. The private eye is a reference to Max Payne slash Alex Casey, and Mr. Door is possibly a reference to Hatch and Quantum Break. Remini's last released game is the single player element from Crossfire X, though we won't get too caught up in the Crossfire. The game has no ties to Remini's connected universe, not even Olympic level gymnastics. Could we stretch and contort our, our, our mind to the fact that they're related? It seems devoid of actually any true marking of a Remedy title. Except this one dream sequence that sorta looks like Control. This game is mainly inconsequential to everything I want to talk about. In 2021, at the Game Awards, a trailer for Alan Wake 2 was released. There are some things of note, but let's save that. Remedy is currently working on six titles, two of which are the remakes for the Max Payne games they made. It'll be interesting to see what they will bring in from their now established connected universe and how much freedom they'll have considering Rockstar still publishing it. Another two are direct sequels to Control and the other being the aforementioned Alan Wake 2. Their importance to Remedy's connected universe are self-explanatory. One title is codenamed Condor which will be a spin-off of Control which will feed into that narrative. The last game is codenamed Vanguard which uh I don't really know what that means? Alan Wake's story is a twisting and turning mystery, despite the game being described as a psychological thriller. With the power of Cauldron Lake, Alan writes, 
departure, which becomes the story Alan is living through. Pages to that book are one of the collectibles in the game. In game, they are really easy to find. They emit a small glow of light in the dark setting of Bright Falls and its surrounding woods. When reading them, it details the story you are playing through. Sometimes it's moments that have already happened, or sometimes it's events that have yet to pass. On a game design level, these pages actually serve a greater purpose. The game's plot can be described as, a man must unravel the mystery of his wife only to uncover a cosmic horror. The manuscript pages though assist you in uncovering the story while playing through said story. Like any good mystery based media, it gives you all the tools you need to solve it if you're willing to put in that work. The effects Cauldron Lake has on the manuscript bring up questions about fate and the human condition. Some of the pages detail people's lives, people Alan has never met, memories that these people have had. Did these moments actually happen to these people, or did Alan implant fake memories into these people retroactively? We can't even go as far to question who the real Arthur of Departure really is. It's easy and probably correct to say that three parties are involved in the creation of the story as a whole. We know how Zane influenced Alan by creating the memory with the clicker. Zane also affected the Anderson brothers and their band by bringing back Barbara, who sent some Taken after the band in 1976. The band also wrote some songs about Zane bringing back Barbara and what she became. The band also wrote a song that helped point Alan in the direction of the Keeper of the Light, Cynthia Weaver, who leads Alan to the well-lit room and the clicker. Alan influenced the others by writing Zane in to free him from the dark place the first time and the Andersons letting him use their farm. Alan also wrote about the memory of Zane bringing back Barbara and realizing she wasn't as she was supposed to be. Alan knew of Zane's existence, or at least that there was a poet named Thomas Zane, because he had found a shoebox filled with books containing Zane's poems in the cabin. With the existence of Cauldron Lake and how those three parties fucked with each other's lives, it brings up a debate about fate versus destiny. A debate that I am wholly unqualified to talk about. Let's just say that the story as we know it was a collaborative effort. The three needed each other in order to facilitate the others in finishing the piece. We can circle back to me talking about how much of control Alan Wake had a hand in. There is a lot of debate about what he did and didn't do, and there's a lot of debate how much the lake can or can't do in regards to the work it translates to the real world. I see it as it can only influence so much gently nudging the story in a direction rather than just making the events happen outright. Think of it like this. Alan Wake works in a similar fashion to the invisible hand of economics. Oh, wasn't expecting a lesson in economics in my video about a game where a guy tries to find his wife but then writes a story and he lives that scary story because it's a mystery of a cosmic horror, eh? The invisible hand of economics is the idea of this unseen force that is supposed to dictate a fair market. Through the ebbs and flow of supply and demand, the invisible hand will be able to self-correct, setting fair prices for the betterment of society. Alan Wake, through the power of Cauldron Lake, is working in a similar fashion. He's guiding these stories to natural and logical conclusions, though he isn't as holistic as the invisible hand of economics. Since he sits at the head of the table, he can use the dark place to fulfill his selfish needs of escaping the dark place. Obviously, he needs to escape to stop Mr. Sc if he is truly a problem that Alan leads us to believe. Alan Wake doesn't mind whoever gets caught up in his numerous attempts to escape. They are either pawns to him or expendable as a whole. Oh, whoops! Did I just describe late stage capitalism and how the invisible hand actually works now? 
The invisible hand is actually a very visible hand. The people who stand to benefit from the control of the market and them dictating said market. Dude, have you seen egg prices? This might either be the bomb joke of the century or the most dated joke by the time this thing comes out. Much like how Alan wrote American Nightmare and countless other AWEs that the FBC has been aware of for over a decade since Alan went missing. It's questions like those and the theories that sprout from it that mark the draw of Remedy's gaming world. Once immersed in the story and allowing it to move through you and out your orifices, that leads you down these paths. Theories about Zane and Wake being connected are actually a representation of the Aurora Boris. You know, the funny snake or dragon that is eating its own tail that isn't about self-destruction that we sort of attribute to it now. It's about the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, you silly goose. That's probably why the Anderson brothers get them confused. Hey, maybe Alan Wake is a deconstruction of Joseph Campbell's monomyth. How Alan wrote the first stage of his hero's journey, aptly named Departure, only to skip that second stage, Initiation, and just writing his return, only for that to blow up in his face. Or we could think about Alan Wake's final line in the main game, it's not a lake, it's an ocean, being a metaphor for different planes of existence, both places of power that we know of in Remedy's universe, Cauldron Lake and the Oldest House, also have their own planes associated with them. How those places are part of a grander scale rather than its own isolated place. Or, in a grander scale, how there are multiple timelines introduced via Dylan's dreams. Whoa. The base of the theory is that the lake is our little pocket that we perceive as reality, but that lake is actually part of a grander body of water, the ocean. Wow. What an engaging way to hook people into a world that has been crafted so delicately for the amusement of both of us, the consumer, and them, the developers. Now, I won't go in depth in these thoughts as they are readily available by other channels on YouTube. What is important about those questions is how Remedy also acknowledges and approaches them. For those first two theories, the blackboard from Quantum Break acknowledges the hero's journey and how he skipped a step. It also mentions how Zane and Wake are a closed loop. In this house of dreams, Samantha comes into possession of Alan Wake's title page for return. On top are handwritten notes with the hero's journey breakthrough. The third theory is from Control mainly. The Ocean View Motel, a place in the game that connects places of power to one another, could potentially be the center of the universe or at the very least our planet. It's great that they aren't answering these questions but acknowledging them themselves and giving us some information for us to use to divine from. There is one question that I've been ping-ponging in my brain since I started this, one that potentially has implications for the game of Alan Wake, the DLC of Control, and potentially what Alan Wake 2 has in store for us. My question is this, who the fuck is this guy? I know that's a picture of Thomas Zane, a character I've talked a lot about, but he is Zane in body only. As we learn in this House of Dreams, Zane's body was possessed by the bright presence, as Zane sank into the lake with the possessed Barbara in tow. When Zane and Barbara entered the pocket dimension, they either left their corporeal forms behind and the new dimension provided a new instance for them to exist with a physical form. This is cemented when during the DLC episodes of Alan Wake, this exchange happens. Wait, are you telling me I'm not real? You're as real as anything else in this place. So there are two of me? Yes. And the one you called Mr. S he's me as well? No. Zane, are you playing some kind of game with me? I am not the author of your story. How can you say that when you wrote that page about me and the clicker? It wasn't one of my pages. You directed me to it. You had Weaver guard it. Yes, she was needed. And you needed the clicker. But 
I'm not. Zane can't explain how Tom was able to write a memory Alan had as a child. All we know about this, Zane, is that he acts as Alan's de facto spiritual guide in Alan's battle against the Dark Presence. We, the player, are inherently going to trust Zane. One, because of how he guides Wake. Zane is the one that trains Alan how to fight the Taken in the dream. Zane was the one that freed Alan from the Dark Place the first time. Quick reminder... Alan was the one that wrote that to happen. During the game, Zane leaves manuscript pages around Bright Falls for Alan to find to help guide him during the story. Zane also has vested interest in making sure Alan's mind doesn't fracture during the DLC episodes. The other reason is how society perceives light and dark culturally. We have sort of been raised to be wary of the dark what lurks in the shadows and all that it's a hallmark of most horror films and in other films shadows are used as a tool to show who we the audience can trust ever heard of uh, uh, king kong hearts it's all about light killing the bad and evil darkness that is a lot of evidence to support that zane is someone we should trust I don't think he ultimately is. When Alan is trapped in the Dark Place for the first time, he is being manipulated by the Dark Presence to write its escape. This manipulation is more of treating Alan as a piece of moldable clay. Get him in the Dark Place by taking his wife and then subdue him where he will write for you. The possessed Barbara acted as Alan's editor, twisting what he had written to fit her needs. In turn, Alan started writing what the Dark Presence wanted, that is, until he wrote his own escape. Alan said a light had saved him. The way Cauldron Lake interpreted the light was the possessed form of Zane being the one to help Alan, since that logically made sense since Zane, or at least the possessed Zane, existed inside Cauldron Lake. Now, this is where my theory starts, so this is all unconfirmed, just my own thoughts. After saving Wake, Zane started his plan to manipulate Wake. Zane manipulates Wake in a suggestible way, very similar to Bioshock. How Atlas slash Fontaine had implanted a trigger phrase, would you kindly, into the protagonist so Atlas could control his actions. Zane has just decided to approach it through different means. Gain his trust by making sure Alan wants to escape. Zane can ensure he gains his own as well. How can we trust a guy who says Mr. S is pretty all right when Alan proceeds to make him his enemy in American Nightmare? I mean, he probably should be trusted at the end. I mean, why not? He is the bright light boy. Have you ever seen Ari Aster's 2019 classic Midsommar? It's his follow-up film after his feature film debut, Hereditary, a movie that takes place in the dead of night. Midsommar is essentially a fairy tale where a person goes to a faraway mystical land and whoops, they were the princess the whole time, well, lived happily ever after. Nothing funny or weird or bad happens to her friends at all. I mean, how could anything bad happen when 90% of the movie takes place in the dead of day? Mr. President, a second old person just threw themselves off a cliff. Midsommar's use of light is unsettling. We've been trained that we can find solace in the light. If taken away, nothing is safe, which is fair. Anything can happen at any time. Things did work out for Florence Pooh's character, even if the means to get there weren't filled with the best intentions. It's to illustrate how even in the light, nothing is what it seems and you should be wary at all times. By playing with expectations, the level of stress and uneasiness shifts. Now, we are on our toes the whole time, constantly looking over our shoulders. The deconstruction of how we perceive light and dark is an important device used in Midsommar. It's my belief that Remedy is trying to accomplish the same idea. Sure, the Zane, the light, helped Alan, but we never learn why. 
it could be an enemy of my enemy as my friend type situation. In 2010, I thought Zane was actually Thomas Zane. I had no other reason to think otherwise, and then proceeded to live my next 12 years in ignorance. After absorbing everything I could, I kept circling back to why Zane acts the way he does. When in the dark place before the final confrontation with Barba Baba Yaga Jagger, a new character is presented to us. Standing before Alan is his doppelganger, Mr. S Zane tells us not to mind him, so I guess it's time to talk about Mr. S in our regular world is an old timey name for the devil. Its roots are from Old Norse, Skrate, then finding its way to Middle English, Skrat, uh, probably. And then comes pre Civil War South hooting and hollering about that old devil, Mr. S. Mr. S follows the Cthulhu way of saying a word we cannot actually pronounce, so. Here is our best approximation. It is interesting that both Zane and Wake say Mr. S fine in Alan Wake, but in American Nightmare, it shifts to the scratching sound of something we can't understand. In Control, he isn't mentioned by name, but he is brought up. How and why Mr. S came to be in Alan Wake is up to mystery. Some ideas are that since Wake will now be trapped in the dark place, a replacement needs to be sent out to the world equivalent exchange like those funny brothers. My question is why does there need to be a replacement to begin with? I guess you could say that Mr. is the manifestation of all of Wake's nasty rumors. He is a psychopath, a serial killer. The only recorded events of people maybe seeing Mr. Scratch are few and far between. Alice sees him once taking a picture of him. Clay Stewart also has said that he saw him, but there isn't much of an encounter. There is a voice diary from a Hartman, which states he heard that Zane has been seen by people in Bright Falls. He was lost to the lake. Thomas Zane has been observed by various townspeople. This indicates to me that the individuals within the lake are not entirely gone. Which would be Mr. Sh seeing as Wake and Zane could look the same. Also, there is the FMV from Quantum Break that shows a frenzied Alan Wake attacking Alex Casey. We can assume that this Wake is Mr. Sh as he looks similar to the photo Alice has. Or at least she took and then gave to the FBC, however you want to interpret these chain of events. All interactions we've seen, Mr. Sh has sort of looked feral or animalistic. He's not really acting human. Even though that is countered in how Wake portrays Mr. Sh in American Nightmare, he's a more composed actual person, but he's still psychotic and a serial killer. All of this interesting goes against what Zane tells Alan. In the Control DLZs, Zane reiterates, saying, oh, don't worry about him, I'm dealing with him. I want to talk about what exactly Mr. S*** could be. In American Nightmare, Alan Wake calls Mr. S*** the Herald of Darkness. This is reflected in the manuscript pages we find. The narrator also refers to him as that. Whether or not American Nightmare did or did not happen, in the game, Alan defeats Mr. S*** in it, but as we learn in Control, Mr. S*** is still operating in the real world, Herald of Darkness could also be another clue on Mr. Scratch's true purpose. It's not calling him the big bad, but it's working for someone else. And this is backed up in a manuscript page. As an agent of another greater being, the dark place he came from is full of terrible alien intelligences, dark presences, and none of them should be let loose in our world. He serves one of them. He'll open the way for them if I don't stop him. But he'll do more. He'll take over my life. He already has my face. He already uses my name. He'll become Alan Wake in every way imaginable and corrupt everything. Unless I can stop him. Though his employer, this higher being, very well may be Zane. And the bright presence just based on how Zane feels about Mr. S***. But why is Mr. S***? A more sinister version of Alan Wake? Well, in some beliefs, when one is close to death, they come face to face with their doppelganger. 
one filled with their bad goop. Coincidentally, that idea was held by the Native American tribes that originally inhabited the area of Washington. So we can sort of piece together that Zane and Mr. Scratch are working towards the same goal. I guess Zane and Mr. Scratch follow the same lines as Bob and Dale Cooper's evil doppelganger. But this video isn't about how Remney drew inspirations from incredible weirdo David Lynch's Twin Peaks. This isn't about how they both take place in Washington and how both towns are logging towns, or how one of the few places we visit in Alan Wake is the Oh Dear Diner, just as a central location in Twin Peaks is the Double R Diner, and I won't certainly mention how Cynthia Weaver walking around clutching her lantern is at all similar to the log lady with her log. Remember how the owls in Twin Peaks were used to spy on people by Bob? Well, I won't mention how the crows in Alan Wake were used to spy on Wake by Barbara Jagger. Why would I do that? And why would I mention how the Black Lodge holds similar powers to the Dark Place and Cauldron Lake? That would be pointless. It would also be pointless to mention how Rose, the waitress at the Oh Dear Diner, is just an amalgamation of some of the women in Twin Peaks. She works at the diner, is obsessed with the interesting character that enters town, or how she is just about lusted over by most of the male figures we meet. And I finally won't mention how the Night Springs comic, there is a secret group of guys that is prepared to handle some sort of dark force, like how the Bookhouse Boys act in Twin Peaks. It would be weird to do that and to say any of that and mention it in this video. I'll just say the one thing Alan Wake didn't take inspiration from Twin Peaks is this. In Alan Wake, all the characters are, are, aren't are incredibly weird and or horny all the time. But a firm reminder that I will not be mentioning Twin Peaks in any capacity in this video about Alan Wake. This is all to say that Zane isn't one we probably should be trusting. He should be someone to be wary of. Alan doesn't even recognize that Zane does look like him in control. This might be a situation where the idea of seeing an unreflected image of ourselves would be unrecognizable to us. Have you ever heard of that? How if you were to walk down the street and you passed by someone who looked exactly like you, you would never know because you don't really know what your face looks like. But it can't be that. When Alan looks at Mr. Scratch, he instantly knows it's him. So why can't Wake recognize his own face when Zane wears it? I think it's one of two things. Alan Wake has been isolated in the dark place for 10 years. He hasn't had any real contact with anyone, so the first new face he sees looks unrecognizable to him. Or what we see in the DLC is the beginning of Alan Wake's next story. When Alan is placed in his own stories that he writes in the dark place to act out, he doesn't remember what the story is. This is because he can't know what he's going to go through and how it's supposed to end. Otherwise, logically, it can't make sense because if you know the ending, why do the story? Why is Zane a filmmaker now? There are posters of Tom the Poet in Alan's dream before he sees Zane's light for the first time. And those posters appear in other places, but there are also collections of poems written by Zane that Alan at least knows exist. Jesse Faden is also aware that the poet Thomas Zane existed. You can hear her in one of her therapy sessions where she recites one of her favorite stanzas from his poem. It's the same stanza that Hartman has engraved by a statue in his lodge. But Jessie's then gaslighted by her therapist, saying she couldn't find any poems by Thomas Zane, but only a filmmaker by that name. You mentioned a poem last time we talked. By Thomas Zane? Yes. 
Beyond the shadow you settle for, there's a miracle illuminated. Hmm. I looked the poem up. Only I couldn't find any poet by that name. I did find a European filmmaker who moved here in the 60s, named Thomas Sane. What? I don't know matter. Hey guys, new Mandela effect just dropped. My therapist is saying a poet I really like doesn't exist and the uh, and really the thought provoking poem I love was just something I made up and the poet is actually just an old European filmmaker. New Mandela effect guys, tell everyone about it. It's hard to say for certain why this change happened. Why Zane is so desperate to get out. This erasure of Thomas Zane is peculiar. When Barry did search for Thomas Zane, none of his poems came up, but the fact that he was a famous writer did. This is in contrast to Jesse's therapist, for when she searched for Thomas Zane, no writer came up, but a filmmaker did. In theory, if searching up just Thomas Zane, both of these results should be brought up. This is assuming both of these versions of Thomas Zane are of equal popularity. The reason for skepticism of Thomas Zane being a filmmaker is this. If the poet is a character he played, how does that explain Emil Hartman? Was Hartman just a character that was created for the film and he just continued to be Hartman for the rest of his life? Also, how does that explain the shoeboxes found within the universe of Alan Wake and Control? The shoebox you can find early in the game that are filled with books of poems written by Thomas Zane. Or the shoebox found in this house of dream that are filled with pages and pages of poems written by Thomas Zane with notes about Hartman and Barbara. This curious case of Thomas Zane is a confusing one with no clear answers right now. At the end of the Control DLC, Wake says that someone is coming. I think it's Zane and not Mr. <laughs> I think Alan is comfortable dealing with Mr. Sch and anything he might have done in the real world. Alan is more concerned with Zane returning to Alan when they make the escape for some reason. I have no real evidence to support this. Just the idea that Zane isn't good as we are led to believe. Playing Alan Wake now as a moron in his 30s was an absolute blast because... Of thoughts like that and all the other ones I didn't get into. I appreciate the spectacle. No, that that doesn't seem right. How, how about how grandiose the story of Alan Wake has become? Obviously, that is all thanks to the legwork Remedy puts into making a game universe during the decades since Alan Wake came out. So playing it now with all this new knowledge, or at least hints from Quantum Break and Control enriches how we interpret the story. When I first played Control in 2021, I had no idea it had any ties to Alan Wake at all. When I first loaded it up, I was surprised to see Remedy's logo, excitedly saying to my friend, oh, these are the guys that made Alan Wake. And then imagine my surprise when they had a DLC dedicated to the man himself in AWE an Alan Wake experience, so to speak. It certainly helps that my brain is fully developed to where I can actually think and try to connect these dots. It's hard to say if I enjoyed Alan Wake as much in 2022 as when I played it in 2010. I certainly processed what I consumed more. Ever hear of mindful eating? Thinking about what you're eating and enhancing the sensations you're feeling while eating with no judgment? It's, it's sort of like that kind of experience. Unfortunately, it revealed some things I didn't like outside of my funny, inefficient flashlight fighting style. Chapter 3 is an unfun, grueling walk in a forest. If I wanted to do that, I would have just played like a Gone Home or a Dear Esther. Chapter 3 is the halfway point of the game. It's probably the longest chapter. If not, it feels like it which is never a good thing. Also, it takes place almost exclusively at night. Remember what happens at night? The boogeymen come out, screaming about how you don't have your fishing license or whatever nonsense their old lives had meaning towards. If I were taken, I'd probably uh, be speaking fragmented sentences about 
Juan Uribe. Chapter 3 also decides that you should run around the Freaky Fours without the right to bear arms for two-thirds of the chapter. The Libs have finally taken over. Your only means of fighting off the Taken are flashbangs, and like the Flare Gun, they rule at dispatching the Taken. It's just very cool how defensive tools are used to just obliterate ghouls back to the Shadow Realm. It's also a very efficient way of handling the Horde. That doesn't take away from the fact that you are running from the trailer park to the radio station to Mirror Peak. It's a lot of walking. It's so exhausting. It isn't running. Reminder that Alan Wake's superpower is that he can only run three feet until his COVID lungs can't take anymore. I could sort of argue that chapter six, the last chapter, is a long, grueling trek back to Cauldron Lake from the dam. It doesn't feel like it, though. It's your last time returning to the lake in the game, and you are so far away from where you need to go. And you also have a lot of chances to drive for long legs of the journey, cutting down time between moments. Also, in terms of player mentality, it's very different. The Dark Presence is throwing everything it can at you to stop you from getting to Cauldron Lake. It even resorts to dropping large objects from the sky. So you are on your toes constantly. You need to navigate an ever-changing landscape. So that feeling of the journey doesn't feel as monotonous as it does in Chapter 3. The problem from Chapter 3 doesn't weigh down the game at all, though. After Chapter 3, it's the best chapter in the game. Chapter 4 is the game at its best, starting with trying to trick you into thinking that maybe everything was actually a bad dream, that you've been with Hartman the whole time doing a funny, uh, a misery bit, unraveling when night falls and the Dark Presence attacks the Lodge, leading you to escape. It's a claustrophobic escape for Alan. The Lodge doesn't have a lot of open space, and before you can even relish the fresh air, you are thrown into a hedge maze, leaving you even more vulnerable. Finally, after meeting with Barry and you guys drive off, the car is tossed off a cliff, leaving you separated. Alan worries about Barry as he makes his way to the Anderson's farm. Then you get to that stage, everything hits right. With the music blasting, with a light show that includes fireworks, you get to work. I've already talked about it, but I can't reiterate enough how much of a blast this moment is. We also get a lot of nice moments between Barry and Alan, especially when they get blasted on Cauldron Lake Moonshine. Chapter 4 encapsulates everything Remedy does well from writing to player empowerment. It should be taught in schools. I'd be doing the DLC episodes a disservice but not mentioning them. I had no idea these existed until I played the game again for this review. DLC in 2010 was just reserved for map packs and downloadable songs for Rock Band. It wasn't an extra story to the games like The Witcher 3's DLC is. Because of that, I didn't keep a pulse on Alan Wake DLC. When I finished it, I shelved it feeling different. They aren't really important to understanding the story of Alan Wake, but they feel necessary. It shows what it's like to be a regular person in a place that is doing everything it can to tear you down into a malleable substance for it to twist at its own pleasure. To show the inner struggle between your outward appearance and every insecurity you lock behind a metal door in your mind. They are necessary because we need to understand Alan struggle with escaping with the dark place more than just dark is bad, we can't leave. It's a dangerous place that will use your own thoughts and worries as tools to tear you down. The DLC episodes are perfect companion pieces to Alan Wake's main story and a great vehicle to show us why Alan is so detached when we see him in control. I know I keep gushing about Remini's ability to write a compelling story and being able to sustain it for a decade, but it's just so enthralling to dive into the lake of the story and just sink and bathe in it. They make it so easy that even an 18-year-old doofus could fall in love with it. It's my senior year of high school. I am absolutely coasting through my last year of high school. Uh, playing Magic the Gathering or Tetris or Pokemon with my friends, e even during classes. One memory from high school that eludes me is how I 
came across Alan Wake in the first place. I don't take pride in a lot of things about me, but I do take great pride in my memory. I can recall a lot from my life, but I can't remember the first time I watched the Alan Wake trailer. I thought maybe it was from some Electronic Gaming Monthly EGM issue that I got. I had a subscription up until 2009. Why that can't be right is in 2009, EGM got shot Old Yeller style by Hugo Dotcom. So anything they would have written about the game, I probably never saw. I don't even know if the YouTube algorithm was a thing back then or how much power it had. Maybe when Remedy dropped its trailer on November 13th, it rose to the trending on YouTube or the front page. Though, it doesn't make sense that a video with, ad, as of recording this, 36,000 views would make it to the front page of YouTube, even in those days. Maybe it was G4 talking about it, though by like 2009, 2008, G4 was just broadcasting cops nonstop, so I had stopped watching it by then. Defying all odds, somehow, Alan Wake got in front of me, intriguing me enough to learn more. I absorbed any and all videos I could find about Alan Wake on YouTube. It's how I knew the objects were gonna be a pseudo enemy in the game. I had watched a developer diary where one of the programmers talked about the bug of objects flying around and how they just made them enemies instead of fixing them. It was the one fun fact I had about the game before the game came out. The thing is, though, none of my friends cared. None of them played it. Yeah, the game failed commercially, but I thought at least I had spoken enough about it with my friends that they'd also play it. Nope. I remember buying Alan Wake. I didn't buy Alan Wake for a couple of weeks until May 25th. You see, in May 2010, there were three games I want, I was stoked to get. The first game was Split Second, a racing game, but instead of weapon pickups, you could trigger environmental takedowns to not only take out the opposition, but transform the racetrack. Split Second legitimately rules, but that one game was also a flop, but it flopped so bad its developer went under, despite having backing from Disney. The second was Blur, an adult Mario Kart with a lot of neon lights. That was the last game to come out that I wanted. It was also the one my friends and I played the most in our last month of high school. The last one was, of course, Alan Wake. That was the order in which I completed the games too after buying all three on the same day. I did this because I knew that Alan Wake would have take the longest time to finish, and it was also the game I was most excited for since learning about it whenever I did learn of its existence. Now, depending on who you ask, me saving Alan Wake for the last game to play out of the ones I bought might be seen as a mistake or a rude thing to do. It's Saturday, May 29th, 2010. My high school was having its prom, I had my suit ready, and Surprisingly, even a date. It's around noon, and I wasn't doing anything at home. I decided maybe I'll play a little bit of Alan Wake for like an hour. I sat myself in front of the CRT TV I forced my family to keep so I could play rhythm games with low latency. I popped in Alan Wake, and instead of savoring it and taking my time, I did the opposite. I grabbed and squeezed the morphine bag and turned the slow drip of Alan Wake into an overdose. Before I knew it, it was 9pm and the credits to Alan Wake were rolling. I was a different person. The idea that I had missed prom didn't exist. I got up and walked to my room in awe of what I had just experienced. When I entered my room, I grabbed my phone. I didn't take it with me to play the game because I thought I wouldn't need it. I rarely get any notifications. We also weren't glued to our phones like we are now back then. Upon... Turning it on, oops, I got a lot of texts and missed phone calls from a very rightfully unhappy person. I cannot stress this enough. I'm the asshole in this story. I ruined someone else's night. I, I was indifferent to going to my own prom, but as a show of good faith, my friend was going to go with me to mine and then I was going to go to theirs. But how could you trust someone enough to go to prom with them if they couldn't even remember to go to their own? 
I, I ruined their night twice. I'm so twisted that I really wanted to read the messages she had sent me here to really drive this point home. I don't have them anymore, which is a crying shame. I think I, I think they're funny. At least I think they're funny. According to my friends, I didn't miss much. They told me they didn't have a great time themselves and it was all just boring. Someone went with an escort. And then uh, uh, the other thing I did miss was that one of my classmates apparently... This is big quotes. I don't know if this happened, but it's so funny if it did. Apparently jizzing his pants. When Monday rolled around post-prom after learning how lukewarm my friend's prom was, though they uh, relished in a uh, homeboy jizzing his pants, they asked why I didn't show up. I told them about an eye-opening experience, what a video game uh, could be, and how Alan Wake ruled. But uh, none of them listened. Here's the thing, though. I am the asshole in that story, but I will keep doubling down on my decision. I think it was important for my growth as a person to play Alan Wake in one sitting and subsequently ruin my friend's day. Not once, but twice. I learned so much about myself in the nine hours I played Alan Wake than I would have at a prom. I might have legally been an adult at this point, but my brain wasn't fully formed. This is shown in how I played Alan Wake at the time. Instead of driving to the coal mine like I did in my 2022 playthrough, I walked. The thought of getting back into the car wasn't even an option that I thought I could do. It goes beyond that, obviously. Alan Wake was the first piece of media that I felt like I had come across on my own. The vast majority of what I had liked or had shown an interest in wasn't wholly decided by me. When I reviewed Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3, I brought up why I even played the game in the first place. That even persisted into high school. The reason I had most of my friends was that I liked Halo 2 because it was something my neighborhood friends enjoyed. So I enjoyed it. Thanks to that, I would have LAN parties with people from high school and they would subsequently become my friends. My music taste was further influenced by them, though not changing too much. Maybe indexing more into classic rock and metal at that time. Obviously, this is a, a gross overstatement. I developed my own taste on my own, but my friends and family have huge influence on it. I think that can be said for everyone. Sort of like, uh, sort of like an invisible force. That's probably shaped like a foot. Example, one of my friends, Sean, was really into Stephen King. In turn, I read Stephen King's Cocaine Fever Dream, It, and for some reason liked what I read. A band I had discovered, The Megas, a, um, this is gonna sound really cool, a Mega Man-inspired band, uh, wrote a song that is, in, uh, The Quick and the Blue, that is inspired by another Stephen King book, The Gunslinger, the first spurk in King's Dark Tower series. Knowing of the name, I checked out the book and I fell in love with the series. I told Sean, who was unfamiliar with the series, and he read it too. It, we playfully called it Harry Potter for cool kids. That's how uh, dope we were. It's just to say that this is all a self-sustaining cycle of just my friends and I sharing things we liked with each other and in turn showing them things we had liked. Alan Wake was and still is the exception. At the age of 18, Alan Wake revealed to me a new way for media to be enjoyed. Growing up, uh, I didn't really watch anything that was truly narratively driven. The closest I got was David Suchet's Poirot, but those were more self-contained stories. Also, I wasn't actually really invested in them. They were only on because my dad liked them and I was just around when they were on. I was more of a cartoon and Seinfeld kid, so season arcing storylines weren't really on my radar. Sure, Seinfeld did and does have overarching stories across this season, but I watched it when it was serialized on TBS. So I just watched whatever episodes they happened to air at that moment, never really consistently watching. I never really read books as a kid. I didn't start reading for fun until halfway through college. Movies were also really watched for the haha funny moments and not really for the story. You think I was 
uh, cognizant of the nuance of good night and good luck when I was 12. This isn't to say when I watched movies in my final year of high school, I didn't care about the story. I did to an extent, but I was on the edge and never really had any thoughts about the story once I was left the movie. I thought Avatar was fine. I liked The Watchmen, but I didn't get its commentary at the time. After Alan Wake, I was pushed into the deep end of the lake of realizing the importance of a narrative. I probably wouldn't have loved Lost, a show I mocked my high school friends for liking, when I finally gave in and watched it at 21. I loved the ending of Lost not because of the questions they answered, it wasn't purgatory the whole time, but for the ones left unanswered. That is something I really learned from Alan Wake, that it's arguably better to be left with questions once something is over. It lets you think and revisit the media later in the hopes you find the answer. And if not, you get to enjoy the ride one more time. The endless need of requiring a piece of media to answer all of your questions at the end to have a satisfying ending is an impossibly foolish task. Hey, you know what two endings are essentially the same? The Sopranos and Inception. Except one is seen as the worst piece of shit ending of all time because of its ambiguous ending, and the other is hailed as a deep and thoughtful ending due to its ambiguous ending. Huh, curious. We don't deserve all the answers in media. We won't even get them in life. For me, that change in mentality wasn't immediate. The seeds had probably been planted along the way in my last year of high school. They really sprouted and flourished thanks to Alan Wake. I'm very fortunate to have played Alan Wake when I did. It taught me to love stories. It really was a story of self-discovery for me. It's probably what made me realize that I didn't want to be an animator a little bit uh, three years too late, but I'm glad I realized what I wanted to do to tell stories that I wanted to tell. Whether people found them and enjoyed them or not is irrelevant. It also taught me that how a game visually looks and plays isn't as important as I was led to believe. Alan Wake's gameplay flaws and it not looking graphically the best by 20, even 2010 standards wasn't something I considered after I finished. I had just never been drawn into a game before. To this date, Alan Wake is the only game I've ever finished in one sitting. It kept pulling and pulling me in until it had gripped me in this story it was telling. Though in hindsight, I wish I sort of went back and rewatched the Bright Falls series to see if it meant anything to the story. After I finished Alan Wake, Bright Falls had made no sense to me and its connection was really lost on me. Almost like I forgot literally everything that happened in it because I didn't really get it and didn't really like it at the time. Without any of the new knowledge we have now, I thought Alan Wake was a very complete work of fiction, and it told its tale wonderfully. Yes, I wanted another Alan Wake game at that moment. I was excited for the prospect of one coming out, but I didn't feel like it needed one. There was something about knowing that Alan was trapped that felt right. Sure, this man was condemned to living in this hellscape of a plane of existence, but you know, aren't we all? Alan represents uh, everyone, kind of. A reflection of the stark difference between how we present ourselves versus how we actually feel about ourselves and how we want to control the narrative of how people perceive us. We're always trying to tweak and change the narrative of who we are, only to be trapped in the problems of our own doing and desperately trying to search for a way out. All it takes is accepting those circumstances for that to help us see the light at the end of the tunnel, even if it means still being trapped. I know that's really a heavy life lesson to learn at 18, but it was necessary for me. Knowing that if, if knowing even if we're trapped, we can still fight our way out. So it's 2021. The last two years have been so bad they felt like one year. Globally, the world is falling apart without much change in sight no matter how much you band together with others. Professionally, it was terrible. You left your job in 2019 because of a toxic workplace. 
only for the world to shut down, leaving you without any kind of stable work for two years. It was even bad personally, as the only good relationship you've had in the past five years had to end because of the world going to shit, leading to two years of strings of relationships that have left you feeling like you're the Barry Bonds of toxic relationships. The only time you've tr felt truly happy was when you finally got to see your team cross the finish line in a positive manner, leaving you crying in joy. You finally feel safe enough to fly home to visit your parents for the first time since right before the world started ending. Seeing them eases that mental exhaustion, especially knowing that they've been safe the whole time. It's December. Things seem to be moving in a positive direction globally and professionally for a number of reasons, even if it only moves the needle slightly. It's the Game Awards. You aren't expecting much because it's usually a long-running commercial than anything else. You're making jokes with your friends about the show as is tradition. There's a voice that sounds familiar in a trailer that runs, leaving you with goosebumps. At first, it looks potentially ordinary. Then it is almost inviting you to view initiation. Then it looks all too familiar, and upon seeing a man's face you start crying at what it is. You're stunned, surprised that a sequel to a game long forgotten is coming back. When Alan Wake 2 was announced, I hadn't finished Control. I knew the games were tangentially related, but I had no idea that Control's AWE expansion would have told me about the potential sequel to Alan Wake. So when the game rules rolled around, I was floored at the announcement. I was crying the second I had seen the streets of Bright Falls. It made me more excited to do this review because I got to replay one of my favorite games and then see if once again I can force people to play it ahead of the sequel. The trailer doesn't reveal much about what it could be. In the first scene, it's in the woods. I don't believe it to be the Bright Falls woods, but ordinary. I only feel this way because I have to think Samantha, or at least the old clicker she has, will play some role in Alan Wake 2. This House of Dreams was originally supposed to be related to Alan Wake 2, but since it never got made, it has been a loose thread. The next scene is in New York, or maybe a facsimile of it. Uh, the Max Payne took place in like Nuit, like Noir and Nork or something like that. Of note, there are three neon signs. I guess you could say the subway like is also a clue given it's on Caldera Street and a Caldera is the same is, is the type of lake that Cauldron Lake is. The three signs are obscure, but we can make very educated guesses about what they say. They read Ocean View Motel, Initiation, and Poet Cinema. These should be self-explanatory, but we'll go over them. Ocean View Motel is a location in control that connects to the multiple places or places of power. Initiation is related to the monomyth and the stage Alan neglected in his original escaped attempt. And Poet Cinema is a reference to Thomas Zane, the man who made the film about him being a poet. The last location in the trailer is Bright Falls. The only thing of note is a sign that says what Zane tells Alan what Mr. Scratch will be doing while Alan is gone. There isn't much that leads us to what this could be about, but that's good. I want it that way. I prefer this trailer to be the only thing I see for Alan Wake 2 until we get the game. This isn't a joke or hyperbole. The announcement for the date should just be like a poster or something. I don't want to see anything more. I want little knowledge or expectations for what the story could be until I'm back controlling my funny little man that can't run good. Alan Wake is obviously very important to me. I am probably not as appreciative of the last game I will be reviewing in the personal hell I've created for myself, but outside of my personal stake in the game, it's clearly something the vast majority of people should at least experience once. The thoughts and idea it leaves you with invade your thoughts and it keeps hold there because of how enticing the new mystery of Alan Wake becomes. Remedy's ability to weave everything together, not because they want to, but because they think is fun, is really a breath of fresh air from a developer. Yes, sequels are something developers do, but some are and aren't related. And when developers do make new IPs, they don't really drop hints to their other games regardless of relevance to the game. If anything, that was the most exciting part of 
research for this review, playing all their games and just seeing how much thought and care they put into making the things that they make and how they wanted them to be related. Whether they did it because they thought it was truly just fun or if they hold all their creations so dearly that they don't want to let them go is endearing. This isn't even considering how much of a darling they view Alan Wake themselves, going so far to make it the center of their universe. Alan Wake's time, both the character and the game, haven't been smooth or easy. It's been a struggle to seemingly get to this point. Regardless, I've enjoyed the journey I've been on that started at 18 and ready for the next stage of that journey, whatever it may be. I'm only trapped on this planet for so long, and I want nothing more than to keep enjoying whatever ride I can get on, especially one that has made me cry and yearn in ways most other things, uh, people or otherwise, have been able to. Alan Wake is the abyss I haven't been able to tear my eyes away from. It's been an everlasting staring contest that for years had no end in sight. And finally, it is uh, we're moments away from the next move in this game. And I just can't wait to dive into that lake again. The same lake that uh, spit out a completely different person than the one that enter it. One that learned what it means to learn how to enjoy something without outside influence. To be drawn in by the world that is forming around me and enjoy the world regardless of how I leave it. Someone who, at the expense of a very dear former friend, matured in more ways than they could have imagined a video game could do to someone. We once again find ourselves standing at the edge of Cauldron Lake, waiting for permission to jump in again, ready to see if this is the end of a decade-long struggle for escape, or the real beginning of a monster that is ready to tear it all down. Who will stand by Alan's side in the struggle, or how alone will he be after a decade of solitary confinement. Whether I'm disappointed by this long-awaited resolution, if we even get one, or be satiated with what Remedy has in store will soon be decided. This ride isn't over, and I doubt it will be anytime soon. Yet I can't begin to describe how happy I am that this ride is finally starting again after 10 years. Thanks for watching or listening or however you consumed this piece of media. There are a couple people I want to thank. This was a long undertaking and long time coming. Uh, I want to thank uh, my pseudo editor slash producer, Galen. You can find him at Call Me Galen on Twitter. I want to thank my very good friend, Flyer for providing me voice work for the FBC uh, dossiers, I guess would be a way to describe it. You can uh, follow him on Twitter and find him on Twitch. There are two YouTube channels I'd like to thank for putting in a ton of legwork for just consolidating a lot of information I had already thought about for this review, but having it just at my hands in one place was very helpful. The first is Hidden Machine. You can find them at Hidden Machine Gaming on YouTube. They have a lot of Remedy and Alan Wake focused videos. The other YouTube channel I'd like to thank is Gaming University. They have a ton and ton of just resources and history about a lot of Alan Wake and control stuff where they find any of the inspirations and giving us lessons about it. Both of those channels have been absolutely indispensable for me for this review so i want to give them love and point people in their direction 